Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research at the IIEA here in Dublin. I wish to wish you all the very best for 2024, this being our first webinar of our work program for the forthcoming year. I'm thrilled to welcome you to Known Unknowns, a preview of 2024 in US politics with Larry Donnelly. Uh, Larry will require little introduction to most of you, but I'm very, very happy to hand over in a moment to our chair for today, who'll do the formal introduction to Larry. Our chair today is Dr. Katrina Dowd. Katrina is Assistant Professor and Ad Astra Fellow in the School of Politics and International Relations in UCD, where she works mainly on global politics and international security. Katrina is also an, an active member and participant in the IIA Security and Defence Group. Katrina, Larry, thanks so much for being with us. I'm going to hand over to Katrina now. Thank you so much, Barry, and thank you all for joining us. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. We're delighted to be joined today by Larry Donnelly, lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Galway and director of clinical legal education, who's been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us. Larry is going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes or so, and then we'll go to Q&A with our audience. So please keep in mind you can join the discussion using Q&A, uh, the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to send in your questions as they occur to you over the course of the talk, and we'll come to them once Larry has finished his address. I would ask, please, that guests identify yourselves and your affiliation when you're putting a question to our speaker. And a reminder that both today's presentation and the Q&A are on the record. Please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Share your thoughts and reflections there. I'm now very pleased to be able to formally introduce Larry Donnelly and an overview of his remarks before handing over. Larry Donnelly is a Boston born and educated attorney who's lived in Ireland and worked in Ireland since 2001. He's a lecturer and director of clinical legal education in the School of Law at University of Galway. He's a regular media commentator, no doubt familiar to many of you, uh, on politics, current affairs and law in Ireland and the United States, and a regular political com com columnist with the journal um, and on RTE. In his address today, Larry will examine several of the key topics in the upcoming US elections, including the likely nominees and the potential impact of third party candidates. He will also discuss the issues that will be crucial and the states that will be decisive in November and an early assessment as to what might flow from the outcome. So without any further ado, Larry, thank you so much for being with us and over to you. Thanks very much, Katrina, for the introduction and thanks to everybody uh, at the uh, IIEA for uh, kindly inviting me to uh, to come on uh, and, and speak to you today. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, look, uh, I'm, I have 25 minutes in which to uh, consider, uh, 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 you know, as I say, the known unknowns of what is going to be uh, an extraordinary year one, one way or the other uh, in American politics. Uh, to that end, I'll try my best to stick to 25 minutes. I could probably go on for a lot longer. But to that end, as you'll see, I slightly amended the title to indicate that I'm going to focus in uh, on the presidential race. Uh, obviously, there's races for control of Congress. Uh, happy to take that on in the Q&A if people want to. And I know there's a lot of uh, knowledgeable people who are watching this and who have questions about um, those races. Uh, and also, um, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time uh, on President Trump's legal trouble, something that could consume uh, a good long session in and of itself. Uh, although, again, uh, if, if participants want to raise that in the Q&A, uh, I'm happy to discuss. Um, so with those as caveats, let me uh, kick into it. Uh, where are we today? Uh, I suppose uh, the reality is, as you know, people will be aware uh, the Republicans and Democrats, they, you know, this is all in the run up to their national conventions. And in the, on the Republican side, uh, there are 2,429 delegates that are available. Those are awarded uh, by individual states. Uh, there are 1,215 delegates. That is, a candidate needs to amass 1,215 delegates uh, in order to win the nomination. Uh, Iowa has just been, uh, has just voted. Uh, and there are only 40 delegates there. We're, we're looking into New Hampshire, where 22 more delegates are available. So uh, we really are only at the beginning uh, of the process that will come, that will uh, end, as you can see, uh, in July at the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So 
Let's pause for a minute and spend a couple of minutes anyway uh, discussing where we're at today because I think that's what everyone is probably most interested in at this juncture. Uh, Iowa, uh, in terms of its results, uh, I don't think they can be seen as anything other but uh, an, an enormous victory uh, for former President Donald Trump. Uh, a lot of people have said, look, this is a sm very small group of people. Uh, it's only half of uh, the Republican Party in a very small, uh, unrepresentative state. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this was the first real test of strength after many, many months of speculation. And the reality is that Donald Trump came through uh, with flying colors. Uh, he won more than half uh, of the vote. He got more votes uh, there than all of his other uh, opponents combined, uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, and um, if I may say that one potentially disturbing figure uh, in terms of those who were surveyed and the exit polling that was conducted is that two out of every three uh, caucus goers in Iowa, whether they voted for Donald Trump or someone else, two out of three uh, do not believe in uh, the 2020 election result. That is, they do not believe that Donald Trump actually lost uh, the election in 2020, uh, which I think in terms of some of the talk about uh, American democracy uh, is quite disturbing. Now, in terms of the others, okay, uh, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, uh, I'll take Ron DeSantis first. Um, the reality is Ron DeSantis, you know, moved for all intents and purposes to Iowa. Uh, he spent more than $100 million there uh, for all of that and for all the time and energy he dedicated to that state, uh, he came second uh, by a whisker. Uh, he is going to do very badly in New Hampshire. He has pulled his resources from the state of New Hampshire. Where he goes is anyone's guess. I cannot imagine uh, that he is going to stay in this race very much longer. Uh, I just see no path to, to victory. Hence, uh, I do believe he is finished. Uh, Nikki Haley, uh, much was made of the weather uh, in Iowa. And in my view, uh, the weather, uh, I think, blunted Nikki Haley. And probably uh, the weather will play a bigger factor in her demise as anything else in the sense that had she finished second in Iowa, a place where she hadn't really dedicated a huge amount of time or resources to until the very end, uh, she would have been the story. Uh, of Iowa, and she would have emerged very prominently with a lot of momentum going into New Hampshire. Um, that has been blunted, I think. Nonetheless, she is competitive with Donald Trump in New Hampshire. Uh, but uh, again, uh, she's still trailing by a decent margin there. Uh, and, you know, she really has to, in my view, uh, win New Hampshire uh, in order to, uh, I suppose, maintain uh, a credible threat. Now, what does she have going for in the state of New Hampshire? Uh, the reality is in New Hampshire, uh, there is no Democratic primary for all intents and purposes. Uh, they, the Democratic National Committee uh, has effectively canceled the contest there. There will be a lot of independents uh, who will gravitate towards the Republican primary uh, and cast ballots there. Uh, and they are likely to vote for Nikki Haley. Um, so that is what she has going for her. Uh, in the Granite State. That having been said, Donald Trump uh, is camped out there. He's doing multiple events in the state. Um, it's going to be very difficult for her to win. Even if she does, the race then moves to South Carolina, which is her home state and where she was governor and does have a strong appeal. But even there, uh, Donald Trump maintains a very big lead. Okay, And on foot of that, uh, the Republican race will move to the state of Michigan, and then on to Super Tuesday uh, early uh, in March. And Donald Trump simply put, uh, has commanding leads in the polls uh, across all of those states. Uh, it's very, very difficult for me uh, to conceive as uh, of how uh, you know she is going to be able to overtake him. Uh, I think Donald Trump is in poll position, uh, to be frank with you, at this stage. Of course, things can change, but it's going to be very difficult for Nikki Haley. On the flip side, uh, in terms of Democrats, uh, look, um, you know, they you can see the numbers there of pledged delegates. Uh, we haven't even begun, however, in terms of on the Democratic side, because 
uh, Iowa and New Hampshire uh, have been relegated. Uh, both of them uh, have been effectively taken off uh, the Democratic primary and caucus schedule. Uh, they for the, the, now there's a variety of, of reasons for that. The first contest that is going to count uh, on the Democratic side uh, is the South Carolina primary, uh, which is taking place on the 1st of February. Uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, look, they have long held a very big role in determining who the party nominees for president are going to be. That having been said, the, the fact is that they are very heavily white states. They are small uh, in population. They are arguably unrepresentative of the United States. Uh, and that, that, that theme has, in particular on the Democratic side of things, uh, has been there for some time. Now, and, and hence the Democratic National Committee moved to bypass both of them and again, start the contest in South Carolina. Now, cynics can be forgiven, however, for noting that in 2020, uh, Joe Biden was all but done uh, after Iowa and New Hampshire. He performed abysmally uh, in both states uh, and his campaign was on the ropes. Uh, an awful lot of people thought he was done. Again, he, for a third time, he had sought the Democratic nomination for president and he was going to fall short. Uh, however, uh, where did he come uh, alive with the help of uh, Congressman James Clyburn and support of the African-American community uh, was in South Carolina. He won South Carolina and the rest is history. So cynics can be forgiven uh, for wondering why all of a sudden in 2024, uh, a president who was vulnerable uh, to a primary challenge uh, and has lots of allies on the Democratic National Committee, uh, all of a sudden, uh, South Carolina is the first contest that's going to count. So there's a couple of countervailing considerations there. But the reality is at this stage, uh, Biden doesn't have any real opposition within his party. Uh, now, again, we can talk more about this, but there is worth a, a note about process there uh, and how, to me, it's still extraordinary uh, that Joe Biden was effectively able to box off the field uh, of potential challenges uh, to him uh, in a context in which, uh, look, there are manifest concerns out there uh, about his capacity, uh, yet the fact that a credible uh, challenger from his party didn't come forward uh, is extraordinary. Uh, again, this will all result in uh, the Democratic National Convention uh, being held in August in Chicago. So that having been said, uh, I think Biden versus Trump part two is at this stage uh, a probability. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, you know, barring something we can't foresee right now, uh, it is the probable general election uh, that the United States and the rest of the world will face into uh, next November. Um, and I say that because as I've indicated, uh, I think it's impossible to identify, uh, or very difficult at least, to identify a path to victory at present uh, for Nikki Haley. I think DeSantis has reached the end of the line. Uh, and I think, again, it's going to be really hard for Haley. Uh, if she loses New Hampshire, in my view, that's the end. I think she has to win New Hampshire. And even if she does, uh, I still think it's a straight uphill climb. Uh, on the Democratic side, uh, we know Marianne Williamson, the, the self-help guru who's kind of ran last time. Uh, she's polling in the very low single digits. She's not going to do anything. Uh, Dean Phillips uh, is a congressman from Minnesota who jumped in at the last minute, uh, way too late in the game, really, uh, and has struggled uh, to make much of a dent. In fact, uh, Donald, uh, sorry, Joe Biden, uh, because the Democratic National Committee is not counting New Hampshire, uh, Joe Biden's allies uh, have made him a write-in can candidate in New Hampshire. Uh, and it seems to me, based on the polling, uh, that Biden is likely to win New Hampshire, even though it doesn't count, and even though he's not on the ballot uh, as a write-in candidate. So I think that's the end. Um, Trump's legal troubles, and it is weird, given the amount of legal trouble that Donald Trump faces, uh, to be relegating him to his the, all of that to one line in this presentation. But um, at least politically speaking, uh, all of these legal troubles haven't meant a damn, at least in the context of the Republican primary process. Uh, they've only strengthened uh, his standing with voters and in the polls. Um, and the time frame here is key. Uh, a lot of Republicans even say that they're, they'd be uncomfortable voting for somebody who's a convicted felon. Uh, time frame is key. How long can he push these trial dates 
which I've always regarded as notional, how long can he delay all of that? Uh, and again, this on this collision course between the legal and political systems is, to use the U word, uh, unprecedented. It remains out there. It remains one of the known unknowns. Uh, but at least at this stage, uh, I don't see it hampering his chances, at least on the Republican side. Uh, in terms of Joe Biden, um, you know, the reality is the doubts about his age and capacity persist. Uh, polling shows can, you know, continually uh, that the, the major overwhelming majority of Americans have doubts about uh, those issues. Uh, also, behind closed doors, Democrats are deeply worried. David Axelrod, Barack Obama's former chief advisor, uh, he's voicing out loud uh, what a lot of Democrats are saying privately. That is um, that we potentially, as Democrats, the Democrats have a problem here. Uh, all in all, and this is the question that people raise around the world, um, you know, we seem to be heading for something that will be uh, distinctly uninspiring. You know, a country of 350 million people, diverse and talented uh, in every way. And, and we're looking at a rematch uh, of two candidates that, again, the opinion polling suggests uh, that most Americans don't want. Um, a lot of the speculation then is focused on running mates. Uh, will Joe Biden dump Kamala Harris for somebody uh, who's more popular? Uh, Harris has, you know, you know, fares even lower in the polling uh, than Joe Biden has. Uh, my own view is that, uh, and it harkens back to something I said a minute ago, my own view that it would be that Biden dumping Harris, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I think, first of all, I think it would be suggestive of a little bit of panic, which he doesn't need. Uh, I think also it risks offending uh, voters of color and women in particular. Uh, you know, again, Kamala Harris, the first uh, woman of color to be vice president, uh, I think it would send all the wrong signals and it would be a uh, risky because Biden is going to be so dependent on uh, turnout, particularly among African-Americans. So I don't see that happening. On the Republican side, there's lots of speculation as to who uh, Donald Trump will pick. Most people say that it will be a woman. Uh, you know, this, some people say Nikki Haley could be the, the one. Uh, for me, it's hard to conceive of someone who he calls bird brain, uh, ultimately being his vice presidential nominee and running mate. But uh, look, stranger things have happened. Uh, others in the ether include uh, Christy Noem, the governor of South Dakota, Masha Blackburn, uh, United States Senator from Tennessee, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the governor of Arkansas. Uh, there are others like Carrie Lake uh, from Arizona, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, you know, look, he could pick either of the latter two, but I think that that would be uh, a very big mistake. But again, the speculation and conjecture will continue. Uh, in terms of the issues, what are they likely to be? Uh, there's lots of them, but I've highlighted five here and I'll run through them uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, I think immigration is going to be a big, big issue uh, in the election. And, I, and by immigration, I mean opposition to immigration. Uh, to me, it was stark that the number one issue uh, for the majority of voters in the Iowa caucus, again, Iowa is up in the north of the United States, very white, very little, very seldom uh, you know, affected by immigration, yet the majority of caucus goers cited immigration as the number one issue. It is a challenge for the Democrats. Uh, the southern border is whatever perspective you come from. It is a mess. Uh, Republicans are convinced that the immigration issue is something that they can play to their advantage. Trump is going to keep beating that drum, whether it's about the wall or the other things. And Democrats have yet to devise uh, a good response, a good defense, a good answer uh, as to where they're coming from. So that one would definitely uh, favor uh, Republicans. The economy and the infl inflation. It is remarkable when you look at all the leading economic indicators, which suggests that the American economy is doing well. However, side by side with that, you have the inflation problem and the inflation crisis that afflicts vast swathes of America, but in particular, uh, working class and poor people. Now, that has been allayed slightly, but it persists. The cost of good and, goods and services is a lot higher, uh, has gotten a lot higher in recent years. Hence, uh, again, an issue that probably favors Donald Trump and the Republicans. And again, messaging-wise, Democrats have struggled on this one, in particular, the president himself. Abortion. Now, abortion was always kind of a tricky one to assess its role. Uh, I think right now, post the overturning of Roe versus Wade, 
Uh, it very definitely favors the Democratic Party and favors Joe Biden. And is certainly something that uh, is going to be stressed, is certainly something that will be a pull factor, uh, you know, for big constituencies in the Democratic Party. There's no doubt about that. Against that, and we've seen signs of this already, watch how Donald Trump pivots on abortion once he is ordained the Republican uh, nominee, when and if that happens. He's already alluded to this before, that in fact, he may have been the president responsible for uh, over the overturning of Roe versus Wade via his Supreme Court appointments, but that he did so to remove the issue from the judicial realm and to put it back into uh, the political realm and let the people decide. And that's how he's going to try to portray himself as he's somebody who doesn't really know. And he's already said, I'm not sure what the best idea here is, but I wanted to get it away from the judges and let people decide. I expect him to frame the issue that way uh, in uh, when uh, around the time of the general election. So yes, it is an advantage for Democrats. Yes, uh, in terms of places where, you know, at congressional level, et cetera, um, it's a winner for Democrats. We've seen already in red states, it's also a winner for Democrats. Uh, but watch how President Trump, uh, former President Trump pivots on that one. Uh, the culture wars more broadly, uh, and this is where Republicans and the, and Donald Trump are going to move. They're going, not going to move. Then abortion is not something that's going to be to the fore. Instead, it's going to be issues around gender identity and parental control over public school curriculum, issues on which they believe they have an advantage and, and Democrats haven't, uh, haven't be able to re been able to respond adequately. So watch that space. Uh, watch as abortion uh, as abortion or Republicans try to move away from abortion and instead to new frontiers uh, of the culture war. Uh, foreign policy, again, which animates obviously an awful lot of discussion here, uh, you know, won't be as big an issue in the American presidential election. It's just the nature of the beast. Uh, but uh, what I will say is that you will see Trump continue to beat the drum that he is the person who kept America out of conflicts someone who he will say with no foundation um, that uh, these things in Gaza and, and and the Russia incursion against Ukraine never would have happened if he was there and that he will solve them quickly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he will also point to uh, Afghanistan and the, the catastrophic nature of the American withdrawal from there. Um, Biden, of course, will cite the danger of Donald Trump and, you know, again, uh, how he's regarded around the world. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that will play. Politically speaking, wrinkles. Um, I think the biggest story in American politics in recent decades has been the drift of Hispanic or Latino Americans to the Republican Party. Despite all of Donald Trump's nasty rhetoric uh, in 2016 and 2020, um, the reality is that one between one third and 40 percent, depending on how you uh, measure it, but between one third and 40 percent uh, of Latino Americans voted for Donald Trump and or the Republican Party. Uh, the Democrats have spectacularly uh, underestimated or misapprehended uh, how Latino Americans would vote. Uh, they thought they would be very similar to how African Americans have traditionally voted, uh, and arguably they, they took them for granted. Um, Messaging-wise, issues-wise, there is still uh, a gap there uh, that I think the Democrats have a lot of work to do. We've also seen some signs in this uh, with Asian Americans as well. Uh, African Americans, uh, again, very reliably uh, Democratic, you know, generally speaking, between 85 and 90 percent of African Americans tend to vote for uh, Democrats. There are two issues here, however. Uh, one is that the polling data shows that there's a distinct lack of enthusiasm uh, this time around for Joe Biden. So turnout is going to be a huge issue here uh, in terms of getting them out to vote in battleground states. That's going to be an issue. The second thing is that there is, in particular among African-American males, there is some growth in support in particular, not necessarily for the Republican Party, but for Donald Trump, the individual, uh, which is something that Democrats need to address uh, very quickly. Early voting, uh, again, in America, you can vote very early. You can vote by post. You can vote uh, all sorts of different ways. Uh, Democrats uh, are way out ahead strategically on that. Uh, they mastered the art of early voting. Republicans still were clinging to, uh, you know, you vote on one day and that's that. And that that's hurt them, I think, very badly uh, in the last couple of election cycles. Uh, they're working to catch up. Will they? I just don't know. 
uh, suburban white women. Uh, these, uh, you know, it, it could be the dispositive const constituency uh, this time around. Um, you know, again, Don they were very off put by Donald Trump in 2020. Many of them who had voted for Donald Trump in 2016 went to Joe Biden in 2020. Uh, given all the other factors that are out there in the ether, uh, how many of them uh, will go back to Donald Trump? Uh, I don't know. It's an open question, but they are a key dem demographic. Um, there are two points there about the men themselves. Okay, uh, Biden's manifest weakness. I don't think anyone could dispute the fact that he has lost uh, some speed off his fastball, to put it bluntly. Uh, there are concerns out there uh, about his capacity to campaign and then to govern. That's why I say uh, surrogates on his behalf he will be dependent upon popular Democrats in various areas around the United States to a degree we have never seen before uh, in an American presidential campaign. That will be interesting to watch. He won't have the benefit, as he did in 2020, uh, of COVID and being able to campaign remotely. So watch that space. On the flip side, Biden and the Democrats have a very, very powerful argument when it comes to Donald Trump and the various things he said and all that we know about the man and what I think quite rightly has been called an existential threat to American democracy. And that's where Biden's, Biden's comment, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. I think there's a very strong resonance uh, to that comment. Uh, and I think we can hear that, it, we can expect to hear that explicitly and implicitly uh, as the campaign unfolds. Um, much has been made of third party candidates, okay, and the potential impact of them. Uh, I would say to you, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. obviously is the one we've heard the most about. Uh, um, the, the reality is uh, Robert F. Kennedy has, he has a fight on his hands, first of all, now that he's declared as an independent, you know, to get on ballots. It's no easy feat. You need to collect a lot of signatures. The rules vary state by state. As of last week, Robert F. Kennedy had qualified for exactly one ballot, one out of 50. Now, he's got a lot of work to do to get on those ballots. Where he does, however, you know, he can be a factor because even if he gets two, three percent of the vote, OK, that could be enough in close run states to tip the balance one way or the other. And with respect to Kennedy, uh, there had been some consideration that, oh, Kennedy is going to take equally, or it could even take more uh, from Trump than Biden. The polling seems to suggest now uh, that Kennedy will hurt uh, Biden more than he will hurt Trump. Uh, and that boils down to, in my estimation, two issues, uh, one of which is that Kennedy's uh, you know, very strong pro-choice position will not help him get win over many conservatives. Number two, and even more damning, uh, Kennedy's environmental activism uh, will not help him uh, with conservatives either. So again, I don't mean to discount him, but he could be a factor, but we're talking on the fringes. And again, we're talking about somebody who will probably hurt Biden more than he hurts Trump. Uh, similar to the African-American uh, professor, Cornell West, who's running uh, on a left of uh, a left a uh, hard left platform, uh, you know, as an alternative to Joe Biden, as is Jill Stein of the Green Party. Again, all three of these arguably uh, hurt um, Joe Biden in the context. And again, could could swing it in a close election. On the flip side, this no labels movement, which people have heard about um, Joe Manchin, the now retiring Democratic conservative Democratic senator from West Virginia, often touted as somebody who will be uh, on the no labels ticket, so, you know, this grouping who says that they want to unite America, um, you know, they are floating the potential of a third party candidate, uh, whether it's Manchin or somebody else. Again, who they take from, they could take from both sides. And then we will have uh, a libertarian candidate, a conservative party candidate, um, you know, who won't make much of a splash, uh, but could uh, in that event probably, probably hurt uh, Donald Trump more uh, than Joe Biden. Look, the you know, I don't mean to be dismissive of third party candidates, especially because you have two major party candidates who are so don't inspire much enthusiasm, I should say. But it is very, very difficult, especially when you get close to Election Day. Uh, a lot of people who say, oh, my heart might be with Kennedy, but uh, I'd rather have 
Joe Biden as president than uh, Donald Trump or whatever it might be. People tend to gravitate towards those who they think have a chance uh, of winning the election rather than simply casting uh, a protest vote. States to watch, and I'll, I'll go quickly here because I know I'm, I'm up against it, but these are the states to watch, really, in my view. There might be one or two others, but Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Nevada, come November 5th, these are the places we're going to be watching uh, very carefully. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, I think, you know, obviously Joe Biden has very strong roots there. Uh, Trump won it in 2016. Biden won it last time around, often described as uh, Pittsburgh and uh, Philadelphia with Alabama in between. So again, that'll be fascinating to watch. Georgia, traditionally a red state, uh, has been affected deep, deeply by uh, transplants from the Northeast of the United States particularly. And we see that that state uh, has moved into toss-up territory. So again, be interesting to watch. Arizona, uh, similar uh, effect, uh, you know, traditionally Republican stronghold, but uh, an awful lot of people have moved there. Demographics have shifted. Now much more of a battleground. Michigan, just one quick note on Michigan. Uh, you know, again, traditionally, at least in recent years, Democrats have won it. Biden, uh, sorry, Trump won in 2016. But what's to watch for there uh, is the key constituency of Arab Americans who Joe Biden potentially uh, has alienated uh, in terms of American policy uh, on Israel in the context of uh, what's going on in Gaza. If they were to stay home uh, and things were to be close, that could give Trump uh, an advantage there. Wisconsin uh, has some liberal, a couple of liberal cities, but a, a, a conservative heartland as well, a place uh, Donald Trump won in 2016. North Carolina used to be a, a deep red southern state, but also affected by demographic shifts, in particular the movement of people from the northeast uh, to North Carolina uh, and Nevada, a similar dynamic to Arizona. These are places where the election is going to be uh, won or lost and where we need to watch very carefully. And this is where all the alarm bells went off uh, in late last year when opinion polls showed Donald Trump actually dead even or ahead in all of these states. And indeed, we've seen recent polling suggesting him to be well ahead in Georgia and also ahead uh, in well ahead in North Carolina and in Arizona. And just to look at the map, what that would mean, let's say Donald Trump did win uh, all of those states, we'd be looking at an electoral college landslide uh, in favor uh, of Donald Trump. Uh, now, I don't view this as a probable outcome, but it's not an impossible outcome uh, in the event uh, that this were to happen. So, uh, you know, look, you know, however you, you see it, this is why uh, Democrats at this juncture uh, are so concerned uh, about the state of play. A um, couple last things, I'll finish up as quickly as I can. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of what I've been talking about so far is the cut and thrust of American politics. Uh, there are institutional issues here as well. And one of the things that is sure to come up, uh, in particular, uh, if the sense is that, uh, that, that Joe Biden is going to lose this election, uh, is the Electoral College. And a lot of its critics uh, say that it is an anti-democratic, uh, anti-majoritarian relic uh, with sorry roots and like so much else uh, of American democracy, well past its sell-by date. Um, I have a very different perspective on that. I'd be interested to hear uh, what people think. Uh, but in my view, uh, the Electoral College reflects uh, the constitutional balance between the power uh, of state and national government. The United States is a vast country, which again is diverse in every conceivable way. Uh, the Electoral College in its own way strikes a balance between uh, those issues, strikes a balance between population centers and geography, uh, states and national government, et cetera. And the point I would make is that critics of the Electoral College system, uh, they often say this is American democracy is broken. Uh, in my view, uh, it is the political system that is broken, not the electoral system. I make a distinction between the two. The political system, uh, in my view, is broken in the sense that you used to have two tents, two big tents. So if you have a, a two-party system in a country as big as the U.S., uh, a crazy design, one would say. But if you are going to have a two-party system, those two parties should be big tents. 
Um, the reality is the two parties have moved to the polls and, you know, increasing a, a hard right and hard left. Uh, and they're not welcoming uh, of moderates and people face uh, a binary choice, even though most Americans are somewhere in the middle. So when people say that the electoral college uh, system is broken, I actually don't think so. I think it's a failure of politics. The reality is that all, all both parties should be able to compete in all 50 states. And when they do, I mean, we have some examples of it. The just uh, retiring uh, go Democratic governor of Louisiana, for instance, or the most popular governor in the United States is the Republican governor of deep blue Vermont. So when they are big tents, they can compete everywhere. But when they get pulled to the polls, primarily by money, uh, then uh, that to me is a failure of the political system, not the electoral system. Um, and the last point I say, that I often make this point to uh, critics here of the electoral college system who question why somebody why somebody who gets the most votes uh, isn't uh, the, the president. Um, you know, look, it's ne the American democracy was never meant to operate or, at a raw majoritarian level. Uh, and I would say, I don't think many people in Ireland would like it uh, if the European Union operated uh, at such a raw majoritarian level. Uh, and I suppose the counter to that is uh, America is a country, uh, you know, but the reality is uh, in terms of America, it is uh, a place that is vast and, and uh, comprised of, of many different states, many different cultures, et cetera. It is much more analogous to the European Union at many levels uh, than it is to any individual member state of the European Union. So uh, what are we gonna face into? And no, I'm not gonna make a prediction, but what are we going to face into uh, on Wednesday, uh, the 6th of November, 2024, at this time? Uh, you know, will the world be breathing uh, a collective sigh of relief or will there need to be uh, a call to action? Uh, and I think that that is a very, very real question uh, in the event that we do have a, a rematch uh, between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Um, you know, in my own estimation, uh, will we see a continuation of an imp the imperfect status quo, which you might call? Uh, and I think the question would be, and I think it's a legitimate question, uh, will Biden serve out his full four years in the White House? I think that would be a question uh, that would be immediately upon uh, lots of observers. Or will we have a, a return of Trump? And I think what that means is that uh, he would use, a, you know, he would seek retribution against his opponents. Um, that we would have an awful lot of people in positions of significant responsibility who do not belong there. Uh, I think we would see the organs of American democracy tested uh, to their limits. And I think we would see very much a drastic withdrawal of the United States from the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, again, I don't think that that's just a factor of Trump. I think it's a factor of mainstream American thinking and where the American people are. For me personally, and I'll close with this, and sorry for going on too long. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, in the event that that happens, um, you know, I retain this sort of abiding faith in the institutions and the authority in, in the United States. Uh, but I'm also aware uh, of what Donald Trump is capable of and, and the malaise that exists in the United States. So, with apologies for ending on a negative note and running on too long, uh, I hope you enjoyed that.